Hi everybody, welcome to the vlog today. So today we're gonna talk privacy again. Um, and and I, I still find it fascinating. The Fourth Amendment um, is requires, okay, if you don't know, Fourth Amendment requires that um, law enforcement obtain a search warrant for things that a individual may have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And what's been fascinating to me is to, to look at some of the cases involving technology and the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment uh, as well, and how these are now, the, the, the technology is now, or what law enforcement is using or trying to use with the technology, it's now requiring certain uh, additional protections, right? So these particular cases are about um, air, airbags, airbag privacy rights. I'm sorry. Um, so the privacy rights or whether or not an individual has a reasonable expectation of privacy and in the information collected by car systems uh, when there's an accident. So there's three cases, um, three different states uh, where a, 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 some, a driver had an accident. It could be there was a drunk driving case, reckless driving, uh, whatever. And the cars were impounded by law enforcement and law enforcement to determine whether what type of charges uh, they were going to bring against that individual. They downloaded the information out of those the systems. And so the, 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 the question is whether or not they needed a search warrant to do so. So in California, 2013, and this is really interesting, the California case, because California is usually a state that takes privacy very seriously. And so um, in this case called People v. Diaz, it's about the sensing diagnostic module. And they actually ruled in that case that there was no reasonable expectation of privacy of the information in that, in that system because it was easily observable by public. So if somebody is speeding, you don't need um, that device to tell you they were speeding. A, the, a person could observe just by looking that the car had accelerated or they were speeding. So uh, th there was no reasonable expectation of privacy of something that can be publicly observable. Now, I found that really interesting um, for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was, which was pointed out in an article, which I will link uh, to this um, in the notes section, the uh, one of the courts argued essentially what you're saying there you're, you you can look and see that a car is accelerating but there may be all you can say is the car is accelerating you may not know why the car is accelerating and they gave three examples yes of course the driver could have pressed the accelerator or a mat uh, could have gotten stuck under the gas pedal and caused the car to accelerate or it could have been a malfunction, manufacturer malfunction, which caused the car to accelerate. And for those three different fact patterns, there are three different conclusions or three different um, people or persons or things that are liable in those particular cases. And not all of them are the driver's fault. I mean, if you actually purposely press the gas pedal and run into somebody via vehicular manslaughter or something like that, if the rug got stuck, that's 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 I mean underneath due 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 to your fault that that could very well be negligence, or if it was a manufacturer's warranty, that's product liability, and you're not liable at all for any type of criminal activity. So, and and, and so that all depends. So the California case was really like because I read it and I was like, no, that's kind of weird. So let's go on to the Florida case. So there's a Florida case, Florida Florida v. Warsham. And the, the, the black box is called an event data recorder in this particular instance. Now, they call them different things. I don't know if they're all airbags or what. Uh, this particular Florida case, I did not see a date and I did not look it up, sorry. But um, the court ruled in, ruled in this case that the defendant did have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that information. So law enforcement needs to get a warrant before they download the information out of that black box recorder. Um, the court of appeals, of course, it was appealed and the court of appeals agreed saying the amount of difficulty that it takes um, to actually get to that data and, you know, the those types of devices to interpret the data and everything like that, that actually guarantees a reasonable expectation of privacy. It's not easy. It's not easy as observing somebody accelerating. You have to go through and, and download and, and analyze the data and everything like that. So they said, essentially, 
that goes to prove that there's some type of reasonable expectation of privacy and given the breadth of the data that's collected. Now, what I'm thinking is happening here is these, these th devices in these cars are now collecting more and more data. And the more data that they collect, the more these privacy rights are going to start to attach to law enforcement getting access to this data, requiring them to get a warrant. That's what I'm suspecting. Um, the Georgia case was the last case uh, that this was about, and it was the airbag control module. And they also ruled that uh, a person has a reasonable expectation of privacy in that particular uh, information and law enforcement needs a warrant. So I'm just thinking like the more likely that the, the, as we've gone on and as we've matured and from a technology perspective, we've been collecting more and more data. And so as more data is collecting, the courts are going to say, Hey, cops, you know, you can't just download this data. You're going to have to get a warrant. It's not saying that they won't get that data. It's just saying that protections apply that you have to go to a court and determine whether or not you have probable cause in order to get a warrant to search that vehicle for this type of information. I just, uh, you know, again, as, as we start collecting things, as we start it, uh, as technology collecting more and more data, some of that data may be necessary. Some of that data may not be necessary. And they're, they're being collected by these systems. It's just fascinating to me you know, how this is all going with traditional law and, and how you're trying to fit all of this stuff into um, the, the constitutional protections of privacy. So stay tuned for our, our random thought. Those of you who are new to the blog, new to Mary Cheney, and you say, who in the world is this woman on here talking about this boring subject? Um, let me give you an a introduction to my background. My name is Mary Cheney. Like I said, I'm a, I own my own cybersecurity and um, privacy law practice in um, Dallas, Texas. Uh, that's why it's affectionately called the Cybersecurity Law Firm of Texas. I have an IT background. My undergraduate degree is in information systems. Um, after undergraduate, I went to uh, law school. Um, it's a fascinating story. You have to look at the other the other videos on the channel to to get the the full story. I won't bore you guys with those details right now. But um, after undergraduate, I went to law school in Houston, Texas. I graduated, took and passed the bar, and went into the FBI. So I was a federal investigator for the FBI, where I investigated cybercrime. Uh, I did that for several years. I was able to serve as an information security officer for the FBI in Los Angeles. Um, and then I started my first career, first career as an entrepreneur. And um, I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. Shout out to Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, I, I was back in Ohio and I started my own consulting practice. Um, and I was able to run that consulting practice for about four years before I ran out of money the first time. Uh, and then I went into corporate America. So I started my corporate journey. I spent times as an executive for GE Capital, uh, Johnson & Johnson, as well as Comcast on the operations side. Um, I never did practice law. Um, once leaving, once passing the bar and going through the FBI, I, I started my career in the operations side, right? On my corporate career on the operations side. So I was director of incident response for GE Capital. I was the um, director of the security operations center for Johnson & Johnson and had a, a stint with Comcast where I was in the global CISOs office. So much of my career up until, you know, a few years ago was on the operations side, security operations side. So I uh, left corporate America to start my own law practice. I started my own law practice in 2018. And I, I only know cybersecurity and privacy. That's the only thing I've ever done. It's the only thing that I love to do. So I started um, my law practice and I've been having a lot of fun on I moonlight as an adjunct professor with the University of Cincinnati, where I teach information security, cybersecurity courses. I also own my own nonprofit, uh, where Minorities in Cybersecurity, you may hear me talk about that as well, where we try to um, create a leadership community for those that are entering cybersecurity, that are in cybersecurity, that are trying to get promoted in cybersecurity. So we provide um, a 
a, a forum for them to 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 map out their careers and move forward in this in this fascinating field. So I just wanted to take a little time out to give you a little bit of, of background about me, just in case you were wondering who in the world this woman was. Thanks. What about our privilege protection plan? What's that, you may ask? Essentially, I think it's one of the most important reasons you should hire the cybersecurity law firm of Texas to handle your cybersecurity and privacy needs. Essentially, whatever we do to try to give you a legal opinion about where you stand from a cybersecurity and privacy perspective is covered by attorney-client privilege. You should check it out. Check out our privilege protection plan. Go to our website now and see if you're interested. If so, give us a call. Is my random thought for the day. So seems, okay, you guys know if you're in the industry that RSA is coming up next week. Um, yeah. And so IBM has pulled out of RSA for fears of the coronavirus. Now, I've been, I, I'm going to try not to rage about this. So essentially the, the, the world's fascination with pandemics, right? Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's like, come on, it's just another thing. So what, what I want to say is like the, did you know factor on flu this year is that over 26 million people have been infected and 14,000 deaths for regular type A and type B flu, right? That's the regular flu and the bird flu. Um, and for the coronavirus, there are about 50,000 people infected and about 1,400 people that have been killed worldwide. Now, those 14,000 deaths that I mentioned before are just in the United States. So it's, it's a matter of perspective, right? But I'm not, I'm not blaming IBM for pulling out. I mean, anytime you get into a situation where you have multiple people from multiple different areas of the world coming into one area and there are, there, there's, there's no real sense of, um, you know, what is spread, how is, how it's spread, but the, the, it's just intriguing that, that we are all so fascinated by, you know, something coming in and wiping out, you know, multiple people in a population. And, and, and so I don't know, just my random thought, it has absolutely nothing to do with cybersecurity. Only race, only way it had to do with cybersecurity is because we were talking about RSA, which is a cybersecurity conference. For those of you who didn't know, RSA is a cybersecurity conference in San Francisco. Um, next week, the 23rd through the 27th, I think it is, um, of February. So for those of you who are going to be there, have a great time. Uh, hopefully you do not get any germs. Wash your hands. They, they have some, you know, disinfective. Stay safe out there. Okay. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Guys, thanks again for listening to the Breach Whisperer blog sponsored by the Cybersecurity Law Firm of Texas. Don't forget to like this post and subscribe to our channel so you can get updates of when we post new things on our channel. In addition, spread the word for me, right? Let's get out there and tell a friend and so they can all become paranoid cybersecurity and privacy people. Uh, don't forget, if you would like to connect with me on socials, you can connect with me on t Twitter. Uh, at Mary N. Cheney. Use my middle initial always. Um, for my nonprofit, Minorities in Cybersecurity, that, that is at Mike Leadership. And Instagram and Facebook at MN Cheney Law. And you can find me on LinkedIn just by searching for my name. So if you're interested, connect with me. Thanks again. And just remember, awareness equals knowledge.